Hi everybody, welcome back to Great Texts, John Dewey's Art as Experience. Today we're talking about chapter nine, the common substance of the arts. Um, and as the title suggests, this chapter concerns what is common to all uh, forms of art in, uh, in terms of their substance, right? So what, what do all works of art have in common in terms of their substance? Now Dewey starts off the chapter with this question, what, is, uh, what subject matter is appropriate for art? right? What kinds of things can artworks be about? And in a sense, I mean, Dewey has no really um, interesting answer to this question. Um, to, to give it away, right? Anything that creates an impulsion of the art in, in, the art, in an artist is uh, a suitable subject matter for art. So, so anything really, potentially. Um, but it's an important question for Dewey to ask about um, insofar as one historically prominent answer to the question of the chapter of the common substance of the arts concerns precisely this, that art uh, concerns certain subject matters that are appropriate for representation among the finer things. So on this view, the appropriate subjects for painting, for example, are things like royalty and nobility, um, historical events of great heroism, tales from scripture, uh, Greek and Roman mythology, and so on. These are the kinds of things that artwork should be about. Now Dewey brings up several examples of painters who broke that convention and effectively revolutionized the art of their time by just by painting ordinary themes. So for example, here's a, 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 a painting by Bruegel the Elder. Um, it's called Peasant Wedding from 1580, uh, 1567 rather. Um, and, and Bruegel um, uh, loved to paint these sort of scenes of everyday life of the peasantry, not nobles. Um, and, and this was in a way revolutionary. Here's another uh, work in this vein by Chardin, uh, 1738. Um, this is called Woman Cleaning Turnips, uh, or sometimes called The Kitchen Maid. Um, and it's just a scene from everyday, uh, everyday life. So Dewey sums up his view uh, on this in the following way. He says, Impulsion beyond all limits that are externally set, set inheres in the very nature of the artist's work. It belongs to the very character of the creative mind to reach out and seize any material that stirs it, so that the value of that material may be pressed out and become the matter of a new experience. Refusal to acknowledge the boundaries set by convention is the source of frequent denunciations of, object, of objects of art as immoral. But one of the functions of art is precisely to sap the moralistic timidity that causes the mind to shy away from some materials and refuse to admit them into the clear and purifying light of perceptive consciousness. So there, I think it's quite clear that Dewey is saying um, uh, that any restriction from uh, a moral sense or, or conventionality or a sense of what uh, is appropriate to the finer things of art uh, is, is always going to be a problem that art needs to overcome. Now Dewey spends a lot of time uh, in this chapter expanding on the notion of pervading qualitative unity or uh, pervading underlying qualitative wholes or an inclusive qualitative whole or a unifi unifying pervasive quality in different uh, ways he expresses the same basic idea. Um, so, so this idea the, that, uh, that the work of art has a pervading qualitative unity is another common element of the substance of the arts according to Dewey. I'm going to call this quality for short um, because of the different formulations and the various, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of wordiness of it. Um, but when, you'll know when I say quality in a technical sense, I mean this, this particular unifying, pervasive uh, quality. The quality is, according to Dewey, what controls our perception of and attention to the artwork. Um, controls in some sense also the production of the artwork. The, this quality is um, unique 
to each work of art, um, undefinable um, in any direct way, indescribable in that sense, um, even unnameable, he says at one point. It can be felt, that is, it can be immediately directly experienced, um, which makes sense because the, the pervasive quality is, after all, the quality of the work of art, and the work of art is an experience, right? Um, he also says it's intuited, right? So he, he um, takes this traditional philosophical notion of intuition and applies it here. The quality, the pervasive quality is a background and a setting, right, on which um, particular things or objects or aspects are uh, discriminated. And in a sense, it's prior to the parts, right? The, quali the, the, quality, the quality, which is a feature of the whole, is prior to the parts. Okay, and in line with that, he says, um, the different elements and specific qualities of a work of art blend and fuse. Parts are discriminated, not intuited, uh, yet the organism which is the work of art uh, is nothing different from its parts or, or, or members. Um, I think that should be or there, not of. Um, so in a certain sense, the quality, the background is prior to the parts which are discriminated within it. In another sense, um, there's nothing but the parts, no additional thing, uh, which makes sense. Again, the quality is the quality of uh, the, the parts, right? Um, on the other hand, when the unifying quality is not fully at work, uh, you have disconnects or interruptions that hamper the work of art. Uh, so he says, if the percipient is aware of seams and mechanical junctions in a work of art, it is because the substance is not controlled by a permeating quality. Without the intuited enveloping quality, parts are external to one another and mechanically related. And there's lots of uh, points like this throughout. So, I mean, recall, though, there's nothing else in addition to the parts that is a part of the work of art, right? The quality is the quality of the parts in relation to each other forming a whole, uh, which is why if you lack that sort of overall qualitative unity, um, you're going to have those, those disconnects, right? The two, the two things are, are the same. Now, Dewey connects quality with mystical and religious experience uh, in this chapter as well. And he specifically points to the notion that um, quality is related to the background, right? To the setting of experience. So, so um, the, the mystical quality or the religious quality of experience is connected with the sense of the limitlessness of the horizon or the, the, the setting of our, of our experience that is made particularly um, uh, obvious through, through art. Now the next major element that Dewey talks about in the chapter is the is medium, right? So um, uh, this is another feature of um, of the of of the substance of art, right? Um, the different arts use different media, right? Um, whether it's music or visual art or performance, but having a medium is common to all arts. Without a medium, you have no expression, you have no art. And so, um, although we've talked a lot about medium in previous classes, he emphasizes here again that um, one of the fe sort of common features of uh, art is that it is done through a medium, right? Um, another common quality of um, all works of art is uh, space and time or space-time. Right. Um, you remember he's already told us that um, art, unlike uh, 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 well, art like science, in fact, prior to science, reveals the connection between space and time. So for Dewey, all works of art are both spatial and temporal, right? Which makes sense because our experience is spatial and temporal. Um, space and time in art, at least, are not only formal or relational but also substantial features of material, right? So that it's not just about, you know, the abstract relation of things to one another uh, in positions in space or um, in, in order in time, um, but it's about uh, uh, directly experienced qualities like 
um, uh, roominess or um, enclosedness, right? Uh, claustrophobic quality, or um, we also directly experience movement as the qualitative change of objects and their relations in time, right? So um, there's also this qualitative character to movement as uh, backwards and forwards, as nearness and farness, as expanding and contracting, and other qualities of the material of art um, uh, that are that are spatial and temporal. Um, and the, the, these are these sort of qualities are full of meaning and value in their in, in their own individual way. And Dewey provides some pretty interesting examples of the spatial quality of certain artworks in the chapter. I'm just going to hit on two here. Um, this is a he refers to to Chinese landscape landscape painting. And unfortunately, again, when Dewey refers to non-Western art, he tends to refer to it uh, as if it's this homogenous thing. But I think we know the kinds of examples he has in mind, like this painting um, by Shen, Shen Zhu uh, from the Ming Dynasty. This is a, a, a work that's called Mount, Lofty Mount Lu from the year 1467. Um, and here you can see the kind of emphasis on um, spaciousness, uh, also a certain kind of unboundedness that suggests sort of striking out and um, uh, sort of perusing the space or, or moving through the space. Um, these uh, long scroll paintings um, are common in um, in uh, a long tradition of, of Chinese landscape painting, right? And so I think Dewey is quite uh, attuned, um, despite the lack of kind of art historical nuance, to this um, really interesting way that such paintings play with space. Um, another interesting example, this is a painting that he references specifically in the chapter by name, which is unusual actually. Um, uh, this is a this is a painting by Van Eyck. He's a member of the Flemish school, which Dewey also refers to as a group in this chapter. Um, and Dewey says that you know here, despite the sort of enclosed, almost kind of uh, tight feeling of the space in the picture in this room in this bedroom that's depicted, um, even here the painting communicates sort of life beyond the walls, the sort of space outside of uh, this particular area. It does it through lighting, um, through the, the very thin uh, uh, window here, but also by using the um, mirror on the wall, the kind, of, um, the kind of rounded mirror, which lets you see more of that space outside. And you get a, a really a good a good sense of the the light coming in from outside, um, get, and and this I think these are the kinds of things Dewey's talking about when he says the the way that this painting communicates space. Dewey says specifically about that piece, you know, that it may convey within a defined compass the explicit sense of the outdoors beyond the walls, right? And I think. Um, I think that's pretty clear, even uh, even when we just look briefly at this painting, what he's talking about. So that's um, that's pretty much all I have uh, for you today. There are a lot of interesting ideas in this chapter, and I've just sort of scratched the surface. Um, but uh, as always, you know, um, please help me continue the conversation on the discussion board or the comments of this video. And uh, I will see you in class to discuss it further. Uh, otherwise, goodbye. Have a good uh, have a good evening.